This is America on the Road, winner of the International Automotive Media Conference Gold Medal Award for Radio, and now in its 24th year on the air. Thanks for being with us as we bring you the latest automotive information from around the world. Today we're going to take a very deep dive into the most dependable cars, trucks, and SUVs in America. America on the Road is brought to you by Mercury Insurance and DrivingToday.com. If you're looking to save some money, you should switch to Mercury for your auto and home insurance. Californians save an average of $670 with Mercury, so imagine how much you could save. Get a quote today at MercuryInsurance.com. Hi, this is Jack D. Red. With me is co-host Chris Teague. He is in Maine. He's uh, enjoying, I think, a new home in Maine, and uh, we wish him uh, you know, nothing but blessings in that new home. Chris, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me, Jack. For the very first time in our recording history, I have an office with a door that shuts. So no more car studios or crouching in closets to hide from the kids while we record. There you go. Well, the crouching in closets thing, I don't want to hear any more about that, okay? So <laughs> keep that to yourself. Uh, I am on the West Coast in Southern California. You were battling the uh, winter in Maine, but Maine is so beautiful. I, I spent a, uh, some time watching Maine Cabin Masters again over the weekend, one of my favorite shows on cable TV. And uh, it just seems so pleasant there uh, some of the time. And some of the time, <laughs> some of the time. Yeah, some of the time, not so much. There. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, winters can be brutal here, but right now, you know, it's uh, it's actually quite a bit nicer here than many other parts of the country. It was funny. I have daughters in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and it was colder there than it was in Reykjavik, Iceland <laughs> over the weekend. Uh, so that's kind of nuts. Uh, but back to the show, uh, off the weather report. This week, we have a very special guest. His name is Ryan Nagoti. He has been on the show before. He's one of the key executives and a, a design guy for Dodge. Uh, Going to be talking about their performance vehicles. He and I took a very detailed look at the Charger Hellcat Red Eye and the Dodge Durango SRT Hellcat, both of which I got a chance to drive fairly recently, so we'll talk with him about that. In the car review segment, Chris will discuss what particular vehicle, Chris? The, the 2021 Toyota Avalon Limited. Ah, the Avalon Limited. And interestingly enough, I'll be talking about the 2021 Volkswagen Arteon. So we have two vehicle models that begin with the letter A and end with the letters O-N. Uh, it's a <laughs> Important theme. factors to consider. Yeah, it's a theme show, I think. Uh, but before we do any of that, we'll take a look at the uh, latest in automotive news. And uh, we have some behind-the-scenes news, actually, because uh, we have early information. It's just now released information. Uh, from J.D. Power on their vehicle dependability uh, study. They do this each year, the U.S. Vehicle Dependability Study. The good news is that uh, vehicles are more dependable than they have ever been. The bad news is in-car technology is <laughs> continuing to be a big pain in the neck uh, to car owners. And this is interesting to me because it's not only a problem for uh, vehicle owners in their first 90 days of ownership, the Vehicle Dependability Study looks at vehicles after three years of ownership. Three years to learn, <laughs> learn how the <laughs> infotainment system works. And yet, uh, it's not happening. So that, that is interesting. Uh, you know, what's your, what's your take on all that, Chris? I, I mean, is, there, is this a solvable problem? I think it is, but it's funny because you and I talk frequently about the fact that, you know, we drive a vehicle for seven or five days or so, and and have trouble with the infotainment system. And, and I always speculate that people who own these things, you develop you know, some sort of muscle memory to get through this. But after three years, if they're still having problems, that, that says something about the, the complexity of the technology overall. Yeah, and, and what they're suggesting at J.D. Power is people will just give up. And they do give up, and they walk away from the technology in their car. They're also looking at, at various apps uh, that most people are carrying a smartphone now, and you connect your smartphone, and you have navigation if you want it. You have a bunch of things that otherwise you would rely on the vehicle to have. So maybe in the future we're going to get a much simpler interface uh, from the car manufacturers anyway, and uh, let the app makers uh, figure out all the usability problems. Yeah, I'm all for that. You know, these these things are all added cost uh, options right now. So uh, the more simplified it can be uh, may end up adding value to the cars and their vehicles for consumers that don't have to spend the extra cash. Right. Interesting to me was the vehicle that uh, the individual vehicle uh, that uh, took the top spot uh, among all vehicles out there in the vehicle dependability study. It wasn't a vehicle that would be particularly intuitive to me. 
Do you know what it is, Chris? I do not, Jack. It is the Porsche 911. That was the highest ranked model in dependability in the 2021 study. It's the second time in the last three years that the 911 has been named the most dependable model. Last year, the most dependable, uh, dependable model was one that uh, I think is much more intuitive to us, one, uh, more, more predictable uh, by those of us in the car business, and that's the Lexus ES, actually the kissing cousin of the vehicle you're going to be testing uh, today. <laughs> It is. It's interesting. It just, you know, speaks to the robustness of the uh, construction of the 911, I guess, and also maybe that people are more inclined to keep up with routine maintenance. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, too, when you're spending that much money on a car or when that much money is being spent on a car, the manufacturer uh, is, is coming to the conclusion, hey, we better screw this thing together really, really well. Uh, <laughs> and we haven't, we didn't see that, I think, in German cars maybe 10 years ago, but I think more recently, they're getting the message that, hey, you know, people are spending big time premiums for your vehicles. Maybe you just should make them work for them really, really well. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, one of the most interesting things about this study for me is that uh, two or three of the most popular categories of vehicles are ones that have the most room to improve, uh, you know, trucks and SUVs. And J.D. Power themselves even note that it's important that automakers address the problem, given the popularity of those uh, categories. So, uh, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's, uh, I'm glad you point, I pointed that out because it's really true uh, that it's interesting that people are, are picking out vehicle segments where the quality isn't as good as it is in the car segment, right? Trucks and SUVs, the, the, overall, the quality isn't as good. Of course, quality varies from model to model. And that's why a little later in the show, we're go going to be talking to you about models. Uh, but in terms of brands, certainly, some things are fairly predictable and some less so. Lexus ranked highest in overall vehicle dependability. This is the ninth time in 10 years that Lexus has topped the list. So I guess that's fairly predictable. Last year, though, it didn't top the list. Genesis, the Genesis brand, did. Runner-up was Porsche. Kia was third. Kia was also the top-ranked mass-market brand for the first time. And then came Toyota, Buick, and Cadillac. So, you know, some some brands that you might predict and then brands you wouldn't necessarily predict. I'm not sure that uh, everybody out there, uh, and probably because they haven't sampled the vehicles in a while, would say that uh, the General Motors brands, that Buick and Cadillac, would be that highly ranked in terms of dependability. Yeah, it's a total surprise, but more power to them. Yeah. And overall, reliability is getting better. But as we said, uh, these uh, infotainment systems, very problematic still. And uh, although they improved in quality uh, a bit and, and reliability, um, just they're not to the place where I think a lot of people feel comfortable with them. So we'll see what happens with that. Mm -hmm. Well, we will talk a little bit more on a model level about this, but uh, what's a new story you have for us, Chris? I'm seeing, and this is a big story that's come out over the past couple of days, that Ford has promised that all of its cars that are on sale in Europe will be fully electric by uh, 2030. So uh, this is going to be sort of a phased in approach where uh, by mid 2026, they're saying zero emissions capable, all electric or plug in hybrid vehicles will be uh, the name of the game. And then by 2030, they will be completely all electric. Uh, and this is uh, going to be thanks to a one billion dollar investment in uh, the Cologne, Germany uh, electrification center, as they're calling it. Well, and, uh, you know, we were just talking about General Motors. I, I, I was musing when I saw this story a little earlier that uh, General Motors really doesn't have a European footprint anymore. I mean, Europe used to be the place where, you know, some pretty cool GM stuff would originate and then it would come over the pond to us. And that's just not happening. And it's, it's not happening on the electrical vehicle front uh, either, although they do have an interesting electric vehicle that's uh, leaping into the market, and that is the Chevy Bolt EUV uh, that is following the, uh, in the footsteps of the Chevy Bolt EV. Uh, this is, uh, the U stands for utility, and it is their utility version of, of essentially the same platform. Uh, they're uh, updating the 2022 Chevrolet Bolt, uh, and then on a longer, almost three inch longer wheelbase, uh, here comes this uh, sport utility that uh, it's not really competitive with the Mustang Mach-E, but the, the fact of the matter is that it is another utility-like vehicle that's all electric. So uh, we'll see how that plays. It'll be interesting to see how that uh, is received in the market. 
Yeah, I actually really like the last generation vehicle, so uh, it'll be cool to see what comes out. But the the thing that's interesting about this Ford announcement is that, you know, I don't I don't think a lot of people think about Ford as an international manufacturing uh, entity, but they have plants and facilities all over the world. So you know, to be able to build this right in the in Germany in the domestic market for that. Uh, it's really interesting for them, but also because they've phased out most of their cars in America or the United States. Uh, so these are going to be Fiestas, Focuses, or Foci, I guess, the Mondeo okay, yeah. and others. <laughs> so they're going to be a you know a lot larger uh, array of vehicles that are getting this electrification than we see here. So I'm really excited to see what comes out of all this. Yeah. It will be fascinating, and we'll wonder if some of that doesn't just trickle over to the United States. Not, certainly, probably... Certainly, probably. I don't know. That's a great construction, but it's probably not going to happen on the car side here just because the market is not demanding cars. But electrification seems to be coming. We'll see whether there doesn't at the same time. And I would love your take on this, Chris, before we go to break. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of consumer push for this. It just seems like we're seeing more and more manufacturers get into this for one reason or another. What's your take? Yeah. You know, I think consumers for one reason or another are I don't want to say scared, but reluctant to to commit to it wholeheartedly. You know, for me, and I've said this many times, the infrastructure just isn't and just isn't here. And I think a lot of people realize that too. But there's also the the unknown. So you know, whether the the manufacturers can push it to the tipping point or not is yet to be seen. But uh, I think it'll be really interesting to watch over the next five, ten years. Right, and we will be right here on America on the Road to watch that, so we'll look for that. Uh, well, coming up is the car review segment. Chris will be discussing the 2021 Toyota Avalon, and I'll be talking about the 2021 Volkswagen Arteon. So we have to watch how we enunciate to make sure we're, <laughs> we're not tripping over each other when we do that. So stay with us, everybody. We'll be right back right here on America on the Road. Welcome back, everybody, to America on the Road. Jack Red with you, along with Chris Teague. We're so glad that he is with us, uh, testing vehicles in the, the rigors of Maine. And the vehicle you tested this week was what, Chris? The 2021 Toyota Avalon Limited. And I have to be completely honest in saying that I'm a little bit of a Toyota fanboy. I've owned several of the uh, both Lexus and Toyota vehicles over the years. Uh, but I kind of fell out of love with them in the past few years. Uh, the the vehicles are still solid. They have some great uh, features and technology. But, I, you know, the styling got a little bit too aggressive for me. And uh, I was looking for some excitement, which obviously came back with the Toyota Supra a couple of years ago. And uh, they've done, a, I think, a good job with the TRD versions of the Camry and the, the Avalon. But uh, in any case, I tested the Avalon Limited, which is... Uh, not, as you would think, the very range-topping model. There are three actual trims that fall uh, above it in terms of price and some, some options. But uh, overall, this is a you know what would have been considered a Lexus uh, a few years ago. Um, leather interior, uh, heated and ventilated front seats, all-wheel drive, uh, 3.5 liter, 301 horsepower V6 with uh, 267 pound-feet of torque. Uh, and and does very well in the snow with the optional all-wheel drive. So uh, all around, you you look at this, and, and a few years ago, like I said, you'd think it would be a Lexus, just, just kind of uh, with the take there. But, uh, Jack, what do you think about uh, how Toyota's moved with the Avalon and the Camry, uh, both sporty and, and on the luxury side? I think they've done a, a great job with both of them, actually. And I think, in particular, maybe the Avalon. I, and maybe they had farther to go with <laughs> with the Avalon. I mean, the first couple of generations of Avalon were were pretty mundane. But uh, then I really think they have started to hit their stride. And there's so much Lexus ES in the Avalon. You get so much value from that platform. As you say, it is in a lot of ways just like a Lexus uh, without the badging. Uh, maybe a, a little less premium interior, but uh, a very, very nice interior, that's for certain. And uh, just on the driving enjoyment side, I think that's a, it's actually quite surprising how fun the Avalon is to drive. I agree. And, and you know, it's fun to drive while at the same time being smooth and confidence inspiring. Uh, you know, we, we had a pretty big ice storm a couple of days ago. And early in the morning, I had to take my wife out for an errand. We hopped in and uh, the car finds its grip and goes. Obviously, it's not a rally car. It's not a sports car. 
uh, but the ride and the communication through the steering wheel made for a very, uh, I'll say simple drive through what could have been a very slick, you know, greasy road. Uh, the inside, uh, as I mentioned, the leather seats, there's plenty of front uh, leg room and head room. And, and Jack, I'm six feet tall, as you've heard, probably 60 or 70 times by now. Uh, but no one was fighting for leg room sitting in the back seat behind me. Uh, very much uh, there, you know, a lot of cars like the Honda Accord and some others have gone to the fast back look with the, the sloping roof that, that tapers off behind the back seats. But the Avalon, if you can call it that, is old school and that it is a, a solid sedan. There's plenty of, of headroom in the back seat, even for kids in, in their car seats. Um, this car had the full set safety package. Uh, so uh, blind spot monitors, rear cross traffic alerts, uh, full speed adaptive uh, cruise control, and many others. Uh, a nine inch touchscreen with a 14 speaker JBL premium sound system. And you and I have talked many times about Toyota's infotainment system, and this, as it was a few weeks ago when I reviewed uh, the Tundra, is still a little bit more complicated than it needs to be, but is far smoother than it was even just a couple of years ago. Yeah, well, I'm so glad to hear that, and I'm so glad to hear that you remain six feet tall. I was afraid maybe if you went out in the winter and got wet, you might shrink when you got back inside and, and warmed up, but I'm glad that you're still six feet tall, and it's, it is a measure that... Um, you should be proud of. So good for you on that. <laughs> well, and, I'll uh, say my elbow bean boots do add probably a quarter of an inch, but I'll let that slide. Yeah. Well, and, and rightly so, you should be having those in Maine. Huh? That's great stuff. Uh, I love those boots. Uh, I love keeping my feet warm in the winter. Uh, <laughs> warm and dry. <laughs> it's a really good thing. So, and I was staying warm and dry in the uh, Volkswagen Arteon. Now, the Ardeon is probably not a nameplate that is familiar to a lot of people. It is a specialty, and it's one of these, quote-unquote, four-door coupes, which is a contradiction in terms uh, in a lot of ways, but that's what they're calling them these days. And wh what that means is it's a highly styled four-door uh, that looks more coupe-like, looks cooler, I guess, than a, a typical sedan would look. Uh, this time around for the 2021 model year, it has a new front end. Uh, the interior has been refined, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, there are new driver assistance options within the car, so that's good. It is a five-person vehicle, maybe a little more comfortable for four, but certainly five adults can fit in there. Plenty of luggage because it's almost like a, a little station wagon with its uh, big hatch opening up. Uh, you can get good stuff like a massaging driver's seat, ventilated front seats, heated rear seats, leather seating surfaces, of course. If you want premium audio to hear America on the road uh, and our dulcet tones even uh, more broadly, uh, Harman Kardon premium audio is out there. Uh, the interior is really nice. And this is a good looking car, too. I, I was in it uh, earlier today with my wife, and she was remarking how one of the neighbors came by and said, oh, that's a really good-looking car. And it takes a lot for people to comment on the cars we have here because we have a new one every week. So uh, that, that tells me that uh, this, is a, this is a looker. What, what is your take on the uh, looks of the Ardeon, Chris? I absolutely love it. And, you know, not even five minutes ago, I just mentioned how the Avalon is not the, the same thing as the Ardeon. But uh, I think it's, it's great-looking. It, it kind of has a little bit of a classic but also futuristic look that, you know, it, it just speaks to me, I guess, is the, the cheesiest way to say it. But, yeah. uh, you know, not very practical for headroom in the back seat, especially for kids in car seats, as I frequently deal with. But I uh, can't beat it from my perspective uh, on a look standpoint. Yeah. Well, if you'd like, I can introduce you and maybe you two can go out. Uh, because I like the way that it's, well, you're a married guy, so you, you couldn't possibly do that. You want to two-time your wife with a car. Yeah, no, not yeah, a good idea. That would be horrible. Uh, it is powered by a two-liter turbocharged four-cylinder engine. This is an overachieving engine because it creates 268 peak horsepower, 258 pound-feet of torque. Pretty good numbers, uh, more numbers than you would expect from a two-liter four-cylinder, that's for certain. Uh, you can purchase it with VW 4Motion all-wheel drive. Uh, in standard trim, it's a front driver. It's fun to drive. It is uh, very maneuverable. Uh, it, it goes where you point it. All of that stuff's good. So this is a vehicle that I think is 
uh, sadly under the radar. I, I think this, the Ardeon deserves a lot more attention than it is getting. It is also not even all that expensive. I think it, uh, it's pricing, well, it's, it starts uh, you know, somewhere around the mid-30s, $35,000 or something like that. And for what you get, what you're getting is a European specialty coupe, very highly styled, great interior, very interesting equipment inside. And uh, you're not going to see yourself on every street corner. That is for certain. So I just think there's a lot to like about the 2021 Volkswagen Ardeon. Absolutely agree. Well, it's nice that we agree and uh, we frequently agree and sometimes we disagree in that uh, they're honest disagreements, uh, at least on my side. You might be totally dishonest, but I, I'm inclined to doubt that, Chris. So those are our road tests for this week. The uh, Toyota Avalon, certainly a a gold standard in its segment and, and getting better and better. I think both Chris and I agree with that. And uh, a Volkswagen Ardeon, a vehicle I think that's really worth a look. It is a good looking car. When you take a look, I think you'll you'll like what you see. And at the same time, uh, I think it's quite a, quite a value for a um, European luxury kind of uh, sedan coupe. Um, swallows a lot of people and luggage and uh, helps you arrive in style. So look for that. And when we come back, we're going to be looking at uh, what are the vehicles that are the most dependable vehicles in the United States. So stay with us for that. Uh, with Chris Teague, this is Jack Nerad with you. And thanks so much for being with us right here on America on the Road. Welcome back, everybody, to America on the Road with Chris Teague. Jack Nerad back with you. And it is question and answer time here on America on the Road. We're so uh, happy to take your automotive questions. We'd love to have you submit a question. It's very easy to do. Submit your question to editor at drivingtoday.com. That's editor at drivingtoday.com. Of course, drivingtoday.com is our sister website, sister website to America on the Road. So check that out. Of course, uh, visit mercuryinsurance.com as well, our spar uh, sponsor, Mercury Insurance. Check that out. Uh, and now we're going to tell you uh, about the most dependable vehicles in the country because we've had some listener questions about that. Of course, over and over again, we get the question, what are the most dependable vehicles out there? Well, <laughs> now we have absolute chapter and verse from a very credible source, that is J.D. Power, with their just released, uh, we had an early copy actually, just released uh, U.S. Vehicle Dependability Study. And so we can tell you with some degree of accuracy what the most dependable vehicles are in various car segments. And so uh, let's dive right in. Uh, and we'll dive right into a, a big segment, and that is the compact car segment. And lamentably, <laughs> the most uh, reliable vehicle in that, that uh, segment is the Volkswagen Beetle, a, a, a vehicle that has gone out of production. We're never going to see that again. So uh, that also indicates that these are vehicles that are three years old. So these are uh, vehicles that have uh, three years of mileage on them by their owners. Uh, Thus, we're able to tell how dependable they are, but the Volkswagen Beetle is the leader in the compact car segment. In the compact premium car, so more luxury-oriented, the winner is the Lexus ES, and that had been, the, I think, the number one car overall last year. So that is a, a big winner in terms of reliability. And it's uh, essential twin brother, or close to it. I guess you'd call them fraternal twins. In the large car segment is the Toyota Avalon, which is the winner in that segment. So that kind of makes sense that those vehicles that are very, very similar, uh, share a lot of uh, the same architecture, as they say in the car business, are both uh, segment leaders in terms of dependability. Mid-sized car, big, big segment. And uh, it, typically it's a, a place where you would think Honda Accord or Toyota Camry would triumph, but the winner is the Kia Optima. And... Uh, Neither the Accord nor the Camry are even in the top three. The, the next two are Hyundai Sonata and Ford Fusion. Among midsize premium cars, the highest ranked is a vehicle we like a lot. Uh, is the Genesis G80. There is now a new version of the G80 out, but this was the previous G80. And uh, the, the good news about these things, too, is uh, they kind of stay to type. 
So if this generation of the G80 was pretty good in terms of dependability, there's a strong likelihood that the next generation would be. It's not a guarantee, of course, but uh, it's likely. And then among mid-sized sporty cars, the sporty cars overall, uh, the, the top choice is the, and the most dependable, is the Chevrolet Camaro. So that's uh, a vehicle to look at in that segment. Uh, it's a fun vehicle too, very good looking. And then in the small premium car, this is a segment that is growing pretty significantly. One of our favorites is number two, and that's the Audi A3. But uh, the number one is the BMW 2 Series. Maybe a series that you're not all that aware of, but uh, that is a, a leader there. We're talking about the J.D. Power U.S. Vehicle Dependability Study and its, its results as we uh, are looking at the most reliable vehicles in answer to listener questions about that. In the SUV segments, of course, the SUV is very, very popular these days. The compact premium SUV that's number one is the Porsche Macan. Uh, the compact SUV is probably not one you would uh, initially think of uh, as the highest uh, dependability uh, vehicle in the segment that includes the RAV4 and Honda CRV. But number one is the Buick Envision. Uh, RAV4 is number two and uh, Subaru Forester number three. Among large SUVs, this is a, a special uh, vehicle to the, Chevro to, the, to the Chevrolet, to the Chevrolet household, no, to the NERAD household. We're talking about the Chevrolet Tahoe. We've been driving Chevrolet Tahoes uh, for a long, long time and uh, swear by them. So apparently we've chosen right <laughs> because uh, J.D. Power says and their owners say that they are very, very dependable. Uh, on the midsize premium SUV segment, uh, we're looking at the number one vehicle being the Lexus GX vehicle we like a lot. Mid-size SUV. Another one not necessarily intuitive, I think. The Kia Sorento uh, is the top in that uh, very, very popular segment that includes the uh, Toyota Highlander and the Honda Pilot and uh, the Ford Explorer. Ford Edge is number three. Highlander is number two in that segment in terms of uh, most dependable. And the highest ranked in dependability among small premium SUVs is the Mercedes-Benz GLA, which is also a really, really good-looking vehicle, a uh, vehicle I like a lot. And then in small SUV, and that is a uh, booming segment, the highest ranked vehicle in terms of dependability is the Kia Sportage. So uh, a vehicle that uh, we like a lot. Buick Encore. Buick scoring well in the SUV segments. <laughs> not Again, not something you would necessarily guess. Uh, would happen. And then let's look at pickup trucks because, wow, they are s super popular. All, all the truck segments actually are very, very popular, and so let's look at those. The large heavy-duty pickup truck that is most reliable is the Chevrolet Silverado HD. Uh, Ram 2500, 3500 is uh, number two. Large light-duty pickups, that's your typical pickup uh, you would see out there. Toyota Tundra, built in San Antonio, Texas is the number one, and then the Chevrolet Silverado, number two, Ram 1500, number three, a lot of great choices there. And uh, in, in midsize pickups, uh, the Nissan Frontier is the most dependable. There's going to be an all-new Nissan Frontier for 2022. We have some of the data on that already, so look for that. And then there's the Honda Ridgeline, which is a very specialty vehicle in that segment. And finally, let's look at minivans. This one is, I think, fairly intuitive. Uh, one you would probably guess uh, as the leader in the minivan segment, and that's the Toyota Sienna. This is a vehicle we like a lot, too. This new generation, this, this actually the dependability index covered a, a vehicle uh, of the previous generation. But the newest generation that's just recently been introduced, uh, geez, I like a lot. I think uh, they really come a long way to being competitive with the Dodge Grand Caravan, the Chrysler Pacifica. Those are the other two vehicles on this list. So a lot of great and dependable vehicles out there. Top brands are Lexus, Porsche, Kia, Toyota, and Buick, and Cadillac. Uh, those are the top five. There's actually six of the top five because there was a tie for fifth. Is that right? Is that six? Yes, it is. Uh, I'm doing my counting here as I'm looking at my notes. And then there are the vehicles that are not so stellar, or at least brands that are not so stellar. We're not talking, they don't identify uh, particular vehicles for this <laughs> dubious honor. Uh, but the brands that don't score all that well in terms of dependability are Land Rover, and I'm reading from the bottom, Land Rover, 
Alfa Romeo, Jaguar, and Chrysler. And Volkswagen is uh, one step up there. If if Tesla were to be included here, and, and J.D. Power did do owner surveys on Tesla, but it is not officially included in the study for some technical reasons, actually, uh, that have to do with where they were able to get uh, the ownership surveys. Tesla would be toward the bottom, too. I, it would be, I think, fourth from the bottom, if I'm reading this correctly. Um, it would have uh, outdone... Uh, been outdone by Chrysler uh, in terms of quality, and uh, it would uh, outrank only Jaguar, Alpha, and uh, Land Rover in terms of overall quality. And I have to guess and wonder whether that is going to bite Tesla over time, especially when new and very uh, interesting electric vehicles are available from other brands uh, that offer better product quality. So we'll have to see how that develops in in future weeks, in future months, in future years, as this goes on, certainly Tesla owners love their Teslas, so uh, that has a lot to do with it as well uh, in terms of what's going on. So that is our listener question, actually listener questions for this week, and uh, thanks so much for staying with us through that. When we come back, we're going to be talking with Ryan Nagoti of uh, Dodge, about uh, a lot of Dodge performance vehicles. He is a designer there, does a lot of interior design. We're going to talk about a bit about that and about uh, the uh, Uconnect system that we like so much, uh, the connectivity system that they have. So stay with us for that interview with uh, Ryan Nagoti and with uh, Chris Teague. This is Jack Nerad with you. Thanks so much for being with us on America on the Road. everybody to America on the Road Jack Nerad with you. We are at Carolina Motorsports Park, so if you hear the squealing of tires in the background or the roar of exhaust, that's why. It's uh, not something I had for lunch, although maybe. Uh, with me is Ryan Nagoti. Uh, we have had him on the show very recently talking about TRX. Now we're going to talk about Uconnect and interiors as well. Ryan, thanks for being with us, number one. No, well, thanks for having me back. It's great. Yes, and uh, thanks so much for being back. Uh, we have loved Uconnect probably since it was instituted. Uh, we being not only me, but other journalists, you know, we really appreciate how well it works and how intuitive it is. Now you're, uh, I guess uh, this would be the fifth generation if five makes sense. Uconnect Correct. five sounds like the fifth generation. Tell us uh, a bit about what we should know just off the top about Uconnect five. Yeah, it's um, really, it's it's the fifth gen, as you mentioned. It's a culmination of, honestly, 15 years of really being in, you know, with our infotainment system. Um, you know, 15, 15 years ago, we launched the first gen of the system. And really, it's just been sharpening our pencils ever since, listening, getting the customer feedback, and really not making, you know, massive changes left and right, staying pretty straight and narrow, and just building upon what we have. The system... The brand new system that's launching in the 2021 uh, Durango, as well as our Pacifica, um, is really it's the culmination of those 15 years. It's the the fastest we you know uh, version of this operating system that we've ever had. Uh, it's Android based, uh, so that's something brand new for all of our UConnect um, systems going forward. Um, it's uh, personalized, very much more personalized than even before. Uh, you have the ability to um, have up to five drivers uh, assigned in the vehicle, uh, as well as valet, and those profiles actually will transfer with you. So you get into another vehicle that has Uconnect 5, uh, all of your settings will, will come right with, with it. So it's a very much more of a familiar, I think, uh, of what you do, deal with maybe on your personal phones, personal devices. It's a connection of that. Uh, speaking of devices, uh, we can have uh, you know two iPhones uh, connected at the same time, uh, or or Android phones at the same time, which is great. Yeah, you have a work phone and Correct. a uh, personal phone, and uh, I think you're listening on Spotify, maybe on your kid's Spotify or something like that. If I remember correctly. Yeah, correct. yeah, it's <laughs> it's uh it's a cool thing to to be able to uh, pick up a, t a telephone call with your work phone, and then yeah, maybe you got you have your uh, other phone plugged in you know, stream in your media, which is great. It, it seemed like in the presentation this morning, more time was spent on Uconnect 5 than any other aspect of any of the vehicles we were looking at. Yeah. And it, it strikes me that's maybe the right balance because it's so important. Tell, uh, tell our listeners how important it is and how important you think it is uh, 
as yeah. an interior designer. No, I, it's such a um, it's a centerpiece now. It's um, you know like an exterior. You're you're based on the wheelbase, the 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 proportions. You know, it's the infotainment system is is definitely a, a good challenge for us. You know, we work. We work with our user experience teams well in, in the size of the screens, uh, the right content on there, and how it works well within the interior. I know myself and the team, you know, we're all about making sure it's integrated. We don't want to ever look like it's an afterthought, uh, like we just decided to throw a large screen in there for just that just that sake. And, and that's something that um, I think this new system is allowing flexibility. Uh, the, the size of the screen has increased um, from the current, uh, you know, Durango, but I, it, it looks it looks at home within, within the uh, in in the Durango, and it's uh, the rich graphics, you know, uh, uh, also smooth, easy, you know, the pinching and zooming, swiping between the applications. Uh, you know, it feels like an extension of, say, a tablet that you have at your house. Let's talk a bit about the orientation of the screen because we've seen some vertical screens and now you've gone horizontal with this. Tell, it, tell us why and yeah. what, what the advantages of going there, For us, um, it does open up from an interior design perspective. It open up, opens up that flexibility. Um, so as we spoke earlier, RAM was a little bit more 12-inch screen, uh, vertical in nature, right? And that and that fits to the RAM character. Now, if I put my other hat on and I'm and I'm in this Dodge and SRT realm, we really love this this thinner profile width read that we have. And the interior itself improved with that. You know, we just how we sculpted the interior. So for us, fitting in this 10-1, that's a little bit more of a of a landscape type of feel to it. Um, really seamless with the with the applique that's around it. Um, that that speaks well, and I think that's the the things going forward. You're going to see is that we can adapt uh, this system to you know a variety of sizes depending on what works you know right for the interiors we're working right. on. Do you think we will see that in trucks, or do you think trucks? Just by their very nature, are more vertical. Uh, have maybe you have more vertical space in a in a yeah, cab I, than you do in a in a car. I know personally speaking, that's where you know at least where we've been, and that's and that's uh, I think some part of the DNA that we've started with Ram, and then you see this uh, driver centric little tilt to to the display which we have on the new Durango. It matches the counterparts that we have within the stable of Charger and Challenger in terms of about a, about a seven degree tilt to the driver. Um, but it's just enough to hint at this driver-centric performance feel, but it doesn't it doesn't ignore the passenger because you and we know that this Durango it's it's not just about a driver. You're going to be hauling your family with you. That's the whole point behind an SUV. And, you know, stuff, dogs, whatever you name it. Is seven degrees better than ten or twelve? I think we found a happy medium. You know, yeah. I, I, there's no Five prescribed not, amount. You know, right, you know yeah. but. Uh, it's just about the right amount, right? So mm -hmm. it's, it's, yeah. it feels good. It well, feels and natural. I, I, that's part of the art of what you do too, Correct. right? I mean, it's not just numbers. Correct. You know, it's, no, it's a fine balance. Yeah. Um, you know, it's 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 knowing uh, fundamentally what we have to do uh, engineering wise, how to produce this, and that's our job. That's an industrial designer's job to take all of that, but wrap it up in you know a nice bow and and present it to the customer. What do you think UConnect gets right? that maybe some other systems don't? I think the the intuitiveness is is a, is, is one of the keys. Um, we don't put a ton of stuff, just because we have a larger screen, we don't throw a bunch of stuff at it. I also think just the way that we've, do, we've done the graphics, um, you know, you can tell, you can tell exactly where you're at, um, you know, nice, nice size to the buttons. We're not trying to do you know, really small buttons just because we can fit a lot more stuff in there, right? We, we understand that, especially, you're, you know, you're bouncing along, you're at a racetrack, you need to quickly get to something, you know, maybe to, to set up the car in a different sense. You want to do that in a clean way. I think uh, the, in, the intuitive, just the easy to use, that's just, I think, one of the hallmarks of the Uconnect system. Yeah. One thing that we complain about as journalists a lot is having to go deeply, you know, mu multiple screens in sure. to do something. Talk yeah, that's, about that a little bit. The the um, what I guess we would say it is the amount of presses to get to to something right and I and I think we can combat that two different ways um, from the interior perspective we work on redundancy of controls so the the features that we would want a customer to use right away uh, we don't have to we're not expecting them to go through the screen in order to get it so you know heated seats ventilated seats 
uh, your HVAC controls, turning their volume up and down. You know, those Eating those are uh, ventilation and air conditioning. Yes, HVAC. yeah, yeah. That's a that's a correct. That's a um, sometimes I forget. Right, we roll off the the acronyms. Right, um, and, and so having the ability to get to those instantly is great. But then, you know, the ability on the system to um, tune and, and, and uh, adjust a little bit. So if uh, we, what we have uh, brand new for the Uconnect 5 system is called our home screen. That allows you to say, you know what, I'm, I'm a type of person that I want my radio up. Uh, maybe I want my uh, navigation up. But I also want maybe some shortcuts. I tend to use these features of the vehicle a lot. So I want to put a shortcut, shortcut together. And we can do that with the new Uconnect 5 system. And then... You know, you can have up to five of these home screens and you can flip through them. Uh, we have some pre-populated ones, so it kind of shows what you could do, but then the sky's the limit. Any any of the functions that are on the radio, you can shortcut or you can have on this home screen. What are some, uh, you know, just pull one out of your hat that uh, is likely to be done. The uh, performance, uh, hot link to the performance pages, uh, especially in the in the Hellcats and, and Aster T392s that you're driving today, you want to get to, you know, maybe some of the telemetry numbers and stuff like that. So you can have that uh, instantly at your fingertips. So you can show that off to your, <laughs> yes, <laughs> your yes. seat partner, right? Correct, Look you're correct. This. Wow. Um, even even some simple things like uh, I tend to call my wife, you know, and and so you can have a hot button right there to call your wife instantly, right? So it's not uh, you don't have to go through the phone first, then get to it. You can actually have a shortcut uh, done up for just calling a specific person, which is kind of a neat a neat feature. For absolutely, sure. absolutely. When you test something like you connect, and you're you're developing the next system. Do you test with people as they drive? Uh, because I think that's a shortcoming of a lot of systems. Is yeah. They would work fine statically, but mm -hmm. when you're on the move, all of a sudden they become really difficult to yes. use. Yes. No, that's that's good. We do a, we do a, a decent amount of, of testing with consumers. I think the other hand of it is actually the beauty of, of uh, up at Chrysler, up at FCA in Auburn Hills, the multitude of people that are there. Um, and the ability to get into those hands. And it might be someone that actually doesn't even deal with the product side, you know, of the vehicle. So they're, they're a perfect customer, you know, in that sense. So we, you know, a combination of that. Get, it, get early vehicles in their hands, start learning what maybe is working, what's not working, right? And I, I do think that's the beauty of, of building upon the system slowly over the years. Um, and and ki instead, of, instead of quickly changing, doing this, and then all of a sudden... 180 degrees opposite, you know, because then you have more chances of failure at that point in time. Yeah. Um, so it's just it's it's fine tuning that along the way, which is which is great, which is a great hallmark of the system. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'm yeah. I was excited to use it today. It seems to work just swell. So <laughs> yes. Like that no, that's great yeah. to hear. Yeah. We, we love it. So I, I expect that. Anything else people should know about you connect or otherwise we can jump into interior design for these. No, I think the I think we touched on the hallmarks of it. Um, you know, we've switched over to TomTom Tom navigation which uh, again you talk about ease of use, um, natural speech recognition. The system will also start learning maybe your driving habits and start suggesting, "Hey, you tend to go to this place at this time every day." And actually when you get in the vehicle, it might pop that up as a, hey, uh, are you going here again, right? right. Um, that's kind of a neat feature that I think uh, customers will, will start to love. Um, wireless CarPlay, Android Auto, uh, being wireless is is great thing. Added to the wireless charger that we have now on Durango, uh, that's a great feature. So, uh, Alexa, Alexa is also another thing. You know, there's more and more home audio, uh, you know, home integration of uh, devices. And now Amazon will be in the car. So everything that you can do at your house, you're able to do here um, in the car while you're in the car, which is which is a great another feature. Yeah. So there's a lot packed into the Ton into the new on. UConnect Five. Yeah, I'm going to have to spend a year just getting it all sorted out. <laughs> so I so it works the way I want it to work. So yes. that would be cool. Let's talk about interiors and especially interiors as vis-a-vis uh, -vis SRT. Sure. Right. I mean. It's it's got a, a dedicated mindset uh, that that sub brand, if you will. Um, how does that extend into the interior design? I think the there's a fine balance. You know, there's um, it's it's great having, say, for instance, in the Durango lineup, we have the ability to have luxury. Uh, we have the ability to. I, I need something that's going to stand the abuse of your kids, you know, and your pets and stuff like that. And we, we can do that. And that's, it's nice to have a niche within that uh, lineup like an SRT product, very focused, very 
very, in this instance, track focused. Um, and so the materials that we choose uh, are very focused in that. The Alcantara on the seats, uh, you know, to help grip and hold you in the seat is a, is a great thing. Um, just also, you know, picking up on, on um, clean ability is, is an important aspect of any vehicle. Uh, but then I think you want to, you want to, you realize that these are status symbols too, in a sense. And, and they, these are, these are muscle cars. These are show worthy cars. So you got to also have some pretty cool things that draw your attention. So after you're done driving it, you know, you can park it somewhere, pop the hood, open the doors and it, and it still sells itself. So, you know, picking some color choices. Um, also we have a brand new carbon fiber, uh, interior, uh, trim that we added to the vehicle. It's called forged carbon fiber. It's, uh, it's actually like more of a chopped up pieces of carbon fiber and you can have fun with a little bit of that stuff, um, for the SRT, uh, standpoint. And, and it, uh, you know, it's just, like I said, it's a balance. It's a balance of not going too over the top. We realize what these cars need to still do, right? And that's uh, and that's a that's a that's a part that uh, myself, the team, everyone working, touching these vehicles, you know, understands. What is um, one or two things? What are one or two things? I guess is the proper diction there that you're particularly proud of. You think, okay, this is this is really cool that I I did in this car. I I love the ability that no matter what vehicle you 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 jump into um, that there is is wrap surfaces soft touch points all the way from the entry level up to the premium realm. I I think we can't ignore um, you know this is it's it's a it's a vehicle you know any vehicle purchase is a big purchase right and I think just making sure that it feels handcrafted as much as it possibly can and it's just the attention to details there. So I'm proud that. Uh, we were able to work with the team and, and get get that. So on an SXT, you can get a ton of stitching, wrap surfaces, and things like that, which is great. You don't doesn't always have to be all the way up to to SRT. Um, I like I mentioned, I love the the love the carbon fiber. I love the the uh, play on materials that we have um, throughout the entire lineup. I know today we're mo more so driving Hellcats and and 392s. And so, you know, it's, it's refined a little bit, but when you look at the breadth of the lineup for Durango, and that goes true for the rest of our vehicles at FCA, I think we do a really good job of, uh, something for everyone. You know, I think that's a, that's a great, great part of, of interior design and design in general, you know, giving, giving each customer what they want. Yeah. It seems like SRT is able to pull off something that I think is a pretty difficult trick, and that is you're taking a, a vehicle, um, for example, let's take a, a Charger or mm -hmm. something like that. The base Charger is something around mm -hmm. less than $30,000, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. And then you're extending that, I yeah. mean, the elasticity going up to 75, 80, sure. and in some special instances over $100,000, that seems almost impossible, right? Uh, to yeah. do in, in a general business sense. Talk a bit about that. Yeah, that's um, it's it's got a huge breadth. Uh, and a lot of our vehicles that have performance ends, you know, that you, obviously the powertrain, the driving, uh, you know, everything that goes into what's underneath the skin obviously starts to creep you up there. Um, but you realize that there's a set of customers that they are only buying the car for that. They're buying the car for the powertrain. But then there's a whole you know, group of customer base that loves that, but wants to make sure that they're, you know, almost justifying their purchase elsewhere, you know, and, and, and it needs to perform other duties, you know, during the, during the day, during the week, right? It can't just be a track focused machine maybe, right? Um, and so that's, that's the beauty we have is, is to create and craft the vehicle so it's dynamic, it, it, it changes, it's modular in that sense. Um, we can pull parts off of this, put it onto this, um, you know, and be and be respectful of um, of the engineering work and all the work that goes the manufacturing work, right? We don't want to drive our manufacturing teams too nuts, right? We want to make sure there's a fine balance, right? Um, and that's our job, along with the brand teams, um, you know, to really craft the right uh, the right approach. But it's amazing, it's amazing that um, these and these vehicles are sought after, you know. Uh, our uh, our sales keep keep moving. They keep churning, and um, you know it, we love we love giving buzz models. We love these life cycle models to kind of freshen everything up. Uh, and the, and these vehicles are are definitely the hallmark of that for the company. You know the the Chargers, the Challengers, uh, and now Durango even more so. It's uh, it's great to see the breath. 
it seems like the trim levels are, are tightly hooked up to the powertrain, right? Mm -hmm. I, does that help you as an interior designer to to direct yourself? There's a, yes, I I we love having constraints. I think that's the the beauty of of what I think um, you know the goodness that comes out of design. You know, starts with some constraints. If if we had a blank sheet of paper. You know, we could go every which way. We love having to, to kind of navigate and, and kind of slalom through this stuff. So it's it's uh, it's okay. Um, we're, we're happy. We're happy to have some of these constraints. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it makes it more interesting, right? I mean, uh, that clean sheet of paper uh, maybe is uh, kind of uh, in some ways limiting. Or yeah, you yeah. You uh, you might I, spin you circles. Go, you can go anyway, yeah, right? You correct. can just spin your wheels and spin mm -hmm. your wheels and spin your wheels to use an automotive phrase. Well, Ryan Nagoti, thanks so much for being with us. We really do appreciate it. Thanks again for guesting with us. Of course. America thank you Road. very much for having me. And stay with us, everybody. We'll be right back right here on America on the Road. <laughs> and that was our interview with Ryan Nagoti. He is one of the key design guys at Dodge and talking about their performance vehicles. The really exciting 2021 Dodge Charger Hellcat Red Eye. Uh, amazing vehicle. What they're doing with connectivity and how that uh, works into interior design on vehicles and especially on performance vehicles. So we thank uh, Ryan so much for being with us. And of course, we always thank uh, our buddy Chris Teague for being with us out of Maine. Thanks so much for being with us, Chris. Thank you so much for having me, Jack. And thanks everybody for listening. And I will do my weekly plug for the show. If you like what you heard, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and leave us a review. It will help us go ahead and help us keep climbing the charts and get in front of more people so we can bring them for along for the ride as well. And of course, thank you so much for being with us. We really do appreciate you joining us right here on America on the Road. We also recommend that you might want to check out uh, some friends of ours who do a show called In Wheel Time. They're based in Houston, Texas. Uh, uh, three really interesting guys who have a lot of interesting things to say about uh, automobiles. So check them out, In Wheel Time. Uh, available at various podcast outlets. And also check out my book, uh, The GR Factor, Unleashing the Undeniable Power of the Golden Rule. I think you will find that uh, helpful in your everyday life. And that's what we try to be here on America on the Road, is helpful to you, maybe entertain you a little bit, and give you some information that can be useful to you. So uh, again, if you like the show, please pass it on to somebody who might also like the show. We'd appreciate that. And we appreciate you being with us right here on America on the Road. I'm Jack Nerad. Thanks so much for being with us. And join us again next time right here on America on the Road, presented to you by Mercury Insurance. If you're looking to save some money, you should switch to Mercury for your home and auto insurance. Californians save an average of $670 with Mercury, so imagine how much you could save. Get a quote today at mercuryinsurance.com.